is Don Stop. I personally experienced estrangement from one of my adult children. This is beyond the pain. I hope this will be a place where parents of estranged adult children can find peace and healing. I will share some of my experiences as well as some from other parents. The goal is to bring this out of the shadows and stop being ashamed, and then to build up and inspire you. You can find my podcast on Google, Apple, Stitcher, and Spotify. My email address is beyondthepainpodcast at gmail.com. Hello, and welcome to Learn to Love, a show where we talk all about things you can do to build a better, stronger relationship. Our team is powered by passionate volunteers looking to bring forward the best of what they know to help you stay together. Love is hard, but it doesn't have to be. Our podcast, articles, and videos feature insights from the latest research on relationship psychology, intimacy, conflict resolution, parenting, and more. You don't need to go in blind and make the same mistakes as those around you. Check us out on our brand new website at learnlove.ca or listen on our podcast, the Learn to Love podcast. Thank you for joining us in our vision to create healthier relationships and stronger families. Hello, and thank you so much for joining me back at this week's new episode. I'm so excited to welcome you back to our show. Over the past couple of days, we have some really exciting news to share with you. So the first is that we have a number of a new blog post on our website, learnlove.ca, that have just been released. We have a bunch more that are in preparation. Over the past couple days, we have recorded the majority of the content for a new course we're bringing to Udemy, all about things you can do to build healthier, stronger relationships. The focus of this course is to love smarter, not harder. In the course, we're going to be talking about love languages, stages of a relationship, conflict resolution, tools to deal with limits and more. I'm so excited to be making this with the team and getting it online. We're doing most of our editing right now and making some quizzes and worksheets to help you absorb the content. Stay tuned because we're going to share some promotions with you, some discount codes that you can use to get the course at a much better price. And that's also going to help us earn a little bit higher commissions if you if you buy directly through us to support our fees, so we'll give you a sizable discount to make up for that. This week's episode is going to be all about tools that we can use to deal with conflict. We're going to teach you how to prevent 95% of fights, okay? 95% of fights. I don't guarantee this number, but I strongly believe that this is what you can do with this information that I'm sharing with you. And then those 5% of fights that are going to carry through in every relationship, there are some fights, okay? It's part of having a relationship. I'm going to teach you what you can do to deal with that, okay? It doesn't have to end badly. In our work, we work hard, we train, you know, to learn how to do our jobs well. And then we get more effective at them over time. For example, like let's say that you're a developer, okay? And you work with Python or another programming language. At the beginning, it takes you a long time to do something in that language. And then as you get to know it better, you become a lot more effective at it. And it becomes just much simpler, much easier to do things. And when problems arise, when you're coding, okay, you're not going to freak out when you see Uh, an issue, or if you're a web developer and you see it in your your console and there's an issue, at the beginning you panic, but once you get more experienced, you can know what to do, not overreact, okay? The same thing is true with the way we deal with conflict with our partners, guys. There are things we can learn to do better, to understand our partners, what they need from us, what they want from us, and not to feel 
the need to freak out when a problem arises, okay? We can deal with that, we can get experience, and we can learn what we need to solve the problem effectively. Now, in the last episode, we also said that we would be talking today about how we need to take care of ourselves, to take care of others. That is also going to be a theme in this work. So let's get started with our episode, all about preventing 95% of conflict and then dealing with the 5%. Thank you so much for joining me. Preventing conflict. To understand what we can do to prevent conflict from arising, we need to understand the three main reasons why conflict happens in the first place. By conflict, I mean arguing, fighting, tension between you and your partner. So what are those three main things? The first one is to create connection, okay? To create connection. Anger is the most basic emotion. It is so easy to activate in our body. There are a number of things that can activate it. And it's a physiological reaction. We notice it in our body. We feel it. And there are a lot of parts of our brain and our organs that are designed to create anger, okay? The feeling of anger. It's a survival mechanism that has been with humans for all of time. And it's so important to who we are as humans that it is so, so easily activated in almost everyone, okay? There are things that push our buttons. We talked about it in the Soft Spots episode. And it exists. It's common. There's no human except a few very, you know, extreme cases that don't show anger. But everyone has anger sometimes. That's okay. It's part of humanity. But what's, what, where are we going with this? What we're saying is that anger is a very strong emotional response. And if you're trying to create emotional response with somebody, it's the most effective, the most effective emotion that you can try getting them is anger. Anger, because anger, with a little bit of effort, you can create a lot of emotion in your partner if you try and make them angry. Now, why would somebody want to make their partner angry? Because they need connection. This is one of the reasons, the first main reason why conflict arises, to create a feeling of connection. We need connection, guys. We are a social species. This, this theory of anger, it comes, I was first exposed to it through Sue Johnson and her book, Hold Me Tight. She's a Canadian psychologist. She says, we need connection. And anthropologists have also discussed this from looking back to when humans were living in harems, like small groups of a few dozen individuals before cities, okay, for like large civilizations. Connection was required for survival in these times. If you were excluded by your harem, by the group of a few dozen individuals, this is before there were washing machines, before there were grocery stores, it is almost impossible to survive on your own. You, you needed the group to survive. So our genes, I believe, our genes have carried this through generations to us today because the people who put the most pressure, the most work to survive, sorry, to, the people who put the most work to be a part of the group, who, who pushed themselves or maybe had a really strong need to be a part of a group and to, to connect to that group, to be accepted by the group and to contribute to the group, were the most likely, I, I think, to reproduce. People who had struggles connecting to those harems, often, if they got excluded, they wouldn't make it. So the people who made it were those who were the most connected with the group. So if, if you look to today, everyone who made it through from those times to harems to the ability to continue to live and thrive and reproduce today, all of those people, us, are the ones who put a lot of pressure on the need to be connected and who integrated a need for connectedness with a need for survival. So the people alive today are the ones who were the most connected back then. And 
Because of that, we need connection. If connection carried us through all the way to today, then our genes or whatever you want to think about is still going to push that same need for us today. It's a little bit easier today by, by some metrics to live on your own than it was in other generations. For example, we can go to the grocery store if we need food. You know, we didn't have to go hunting with a pack. Um, there's laundry machines. We, we're less reliant on others today to, to survive from one perspective, but we still have those characteristics in us that push us to connect and we still need some sort of connection with other people to thrive emotionally. Now, because we need to connect and it's so important to our survival, it's also very important to our partners. So if your partner feels like they're not connecting with you, and they feel lonely, they feel isolated, like they're not exchanging emotion with you, they are going to look for emotion in the simplest, easiest way possible. And what is that? Anger. Anger. If your partner is picking fights with you, they need to connect with you. It's because you're not connecting in other domains, other parts of your relationship. And if there's no connection and we need connection, we establish that we need, need, need connection, they're going to create connection in the easiest way possible. The way that gets the most amount of emotion out of you in the least amount of effort. It's the most efficient way to get emotion if you're desperate, desperate, desperate for emotion from your partner. I also believe, by the way, that this is the reason why people bully in school. I think that bullies who, who want to bully others, it may be because they feel like they need to have a sort of connection. Maybe they're not getting it in the home from their parents, from their siblings, from their family, and they want to have connection with others. And the best way that they can create that emotional connection is through bullying. Why? Because people remember their bullies. If somebody says something bad to you, you're more likely to remember them. And everyone wants to feel remembered. Wow. Wow. So if there is no connection, your partner may pick a fight with you to fill the void with the most effective way to get emotion from you. And that's through anger. Okay. So what can you do to prevent this? You can work on filling your emotional bank account. And a few, a few episodes ago, we talked about the concept of an emotional bank account. You add to the account any time you share how you feel with your partner and they share how they feel with you. John Gottman would call this leaning into your relationship and seven, the seven principles for making marriage work. Now, this relates to the concept of intimacy which we discuss a lot in our new course. And we're going to work on a blog post on this in the near future too. But intimacy, what is intimacy? Everyone gets this wrong. Intimacy is not just something physical. It's not. That is not true intimacy. That is not intimacy. Okay? Intimacy is a perspective first introduced to me by Neil Strauss in his book, The Truth is the ability to share your worldview, the way you see and experience the world with another and to feel listened to, heard, understood, and accepted. That is intimacy, the ability to share your worldview with another. Now, when you share how you feel with your partner, you are creating intimacy. You're creating connection, okay? When your partner shares how they feel with you, you're creating intimacy. They're sharing the way they experience the world and feeling heard and accepted. We all need to feel heard and accepted. This adds to the emotional bank account. You're creating feeling so there's no void where feeling doesn't exist that you need to have anger to replace. Okay? What are other ways you can create feeling? It's through sharing emotions sharing how you feel. We connect on an emotional level, guys. We are emotional creatures. Why don't you do something? It's because you don't feel like it, okay? We connect on emotions. This is also why a lot of our 
advertising campaigns that we see since the 1920s target our emotions, our emotional insecurities, okay? We connect on emotions. So here's some examples of things you can do to create feeling with your partner, to build that emotional bank account. And you should do this when times are good, okay? Because just like a bank account, when times are good, you want to build an emergency fund, and then you can use that when times are bad. So how do we do this? Through asking questions. Honey, how is your day? How do you feel? I feel really good. Oh, that's nice. Tell me more. What makes you feel good? Huh, somebody cares about me so much to ask. Wow, I feel good because I love the sunshine and it hasn't been sunny for a couple days. And I don't know, I just feel really good when the sun is shining. That's so nice. I like the sunshine too. Although sometimes I get sunburned and like, mm. guys, this is feeling you're creating connection and your partner's like, yeah. And then, and then, because we're leading by example, we always want to lead by example. We showed, we modeled to our partner what we want in the interaction, which is to ask about the day, to probe, to be curious, to understand, to build intimacy, to get our partner to share their worldview with us and create connection. They're going to do the same thing to us. They're going to say, thank you so much for asking. How is your day? Like, tell me about your day. And because you gave them the opportunity to give a long answer, they're going to expect the same from you, which is great. Now you can create feeling. You can say something like, my day was okay. There's this task I'm supposed to do for work and it's really bugging me. It's boring. I've been stuck on it for a long time. And I don't know, like, I just don't enjoy it. You know, when you have tasks that you just have to do and you don't really enjoy doing them, but you just have to do them anyway. And your partner can say something like, tell me about it. I get that. Guys, this is feeling. It's going to be harder for your partner to want to get anger from you to fill a void if you have this connection. Okay? Like, isn't that wonderful? Another example is calling your partner in the day. Like, let's say you have a lunch break or a coffee break. You call your partner. You say, hi, honey. How are you? I just want to let you know that I'm thinking about you. And your partner says, Wow, thank you. I'm so happy that you called. I'm doing good, honey. I am working away on this new project and I'm finding it a little bit hard at the beginning, but the presentation's going well and I'm super excited to show it to the client. And then you're like, that's great, honey. I'm so happy to hear that. And they're like, thanks. Guys, do you see what we did there? I'm so happy. You, you're creating feeling. You're sharing a feeling with them. And they're sharing how they feel with you. It's creating intimacy. It's, it's filling the space, adding to the emotional bank account so there's no void. When there's a void, anger will arise, okay? The next thing that causes anger and tension in a relationship comes from safety. A sense of not feeling safe. Our bodies are wired for survival, and when we're in danger, our body evokes the stress response, okay? This takes energy away from the thinking parts of our brain and to the feeling parts, and it makes us feel tense, stressed, you know, like, urgh, like agitated, and we snap easily. And often, anger will show to cover this. Anger is evoked faster than Sadness, loneliness, fear, it usually shows as anger. So if you see these traits, if you see anger, it usually evokes something else. Very, very often a sense of not feeling safe. So every time you hear, I'm angry from your partner, I want you to think, I'm hurt. I'm scared. This is so, so important. I want you to ingrain this in your brain. I'm angry equals I'm scared equals I'm hurt equals I'm lonely equals I feel like I have so much going on and I don't know what to do equals there's so much pressure equals I really need you to hold me right now equals I just need someone to talk to. I'm angry equals I'm scared 
This is going to totally change the way that you think about and experience anger with your partner. I'm angry equals I'm scared. What does this look like? A lot of us walk around feeling like we're not good enough. Like we have to be perfect all the time. People have so much expectations of us. Our parents want us to do things, our peers, our coworkers. We just don't know what to do. Or like our friends have such and such and we see it on social media and we feel like our life is going nowhere and their life is going so far. And we just, mm, it's stressful. It's a bad feeling. It makes us feel unsafe. It makes us feel like we don't know what's going on. When we don't know what's going on, it's very hard for us to be in control, to feel like we're in control of our situation. And that lack of not being in control, feeling like we're not in control, leads us to feel unsafe. Safety, if you think about it, what is safety? Safety is being in control of your situation. Safety is knowing what's around you, understanding and knowing that you're going to be okay. But if you feel like everything's changing so fast and you're not good enough and you don't have what it takes, you don't feel safe. You feel like there's a risk that you could lose everything. There's a risk that you're not worthy of love from your partner. There's a risk that maybe you're going to lose your job. That all leads us to feel disconnected from our environment and not to feel safe. When we don't feel safe... What shows the most basic emotion? Anger. Anger is a mask for not feeling safe. I'm angry. I'm scared. Also hurt and a whole bunch of other emotions. So what do we do? Well, our brain has mirror neurons and they're going to hurt you most of the time in these situations. But if you understand how to utilize them to help you, they're going to make the situation much better. Mirror neurons are a way that we learn, and it's a way that children very often learn by watching others. The way they work is, I think this is fascinating, by the way, when I first discovered them. I was reading it in Social Intelligence by Daniel Goleman, which is a really, really interesting book. But the way mirror neurons work essentially is you look at something, and then your brain fires the same neuron combination that would require you to do the action. So I'll give you an example. Let's say that you watch somebody do a karate dance, like a karate kata. So like a kata in karate is a series of moves that you, you do, like, like kicks, punches, stances, and you do them together. And the kata is the successful completion of all those moves in order. It could be like punch, 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 block, horse stance, sidestep, side kick, you know, uppercut, block, 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 and then, you know, back. That could be a kata. When we watch somebody do the kata, our brain is firing those same neurons that would get our muscles to move to, to actually do it. So then when we do it after watching them, it suddenly feels easier it's easier after watching them because we got like a bit of a prime of those neurons firing together so that they can fire together again. Neurons that fire together, wire together. There's an important concept of plasticity in the brain, which is going to make it easier for us to repeat the action. By watching someone do something, we can learn how to do it through mirror neurons. Not completely, we still need to practice it, but it's a great tool that we as humans have to learn. Now, do you know why I brought this up? Can you think about why this might be harmful to you when somebody's angry? The problem is, guys, that we often model in our brains what the other person shows to us. So if somebody's angry, we're going to look at them. Our brain is going to fire the same neurons that we would have if we are angry, and then we're going to show an angry face too. This is also how we understand emotion. This is really cool. You guys are getting a lot of, of neuroscience in this, um, this podcast today. So if somebody shows you a face of sadness, you're going to look at them. Your brain is going to fire the same neurons as they think that person is firing to create the face. It's going to create a feeling of sadness to you. 
And you're going to recognize it as sadness, or you're going to make a sad face subconsciously without realizing it. And you're going to feel sad. And then you're going to recognize that that face equals sadness. So if somebody comes in and is angry to us, we may model anger back. They make an angry face, the neurons fire in our head that lead to anger, and then we feel angry too. We often model what people show us. We act as mirrors, guys, mirror neurons. Think mirror. If somebody shows anger to you, you're going to often show anger back to them. I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure you can recognize this in your own life. It also may be a survival technique. If someone is angry and they come to you angry, you think hostile, and then you get angry too as a defense mechanism to prepare your muscles in case you need to run, in case you need to fight. It could be a survival mechanism okay, that, that we use. Now, if someone's angry and you model anger, now you're going to be angry too. And anger is not something that you want because you know like adding fire to the fire makes even more fire. When someone comes to us angry, we want to actually model to them what we want them to show. We want to show kindness, care, compassion, calmness, and it's gonna, we're going to model that, and then their mirror neurons are going to pick up on that, and we're going to help them calm down. If somebody comes to you angry, I know the default response very often is to be angry back. Someone comes at you yelling, and then you get angry and you start yelling. But no, that's not what we want. That's just going to make it worse. If somebody comes to you angry, and I mean, like, if it's a bank robber, yeah, get angry, you know, run. If it's like someone robbing your house, but if it's your partner and they're angry, you know, don't be angry. I know it's hard, but just take a deep breath and model what you want to see. If they come to you angry, model care, model compassion, model empathy. So we talked right now about... I'm angry equals I'm scared, okay? So that's really, really important. Think about it this way. It's going to totally change the way you see anger. Next, we talked about mirror neurons, okay? So I'm going to connect them now for you. Because I'm angry equals I'm scared, I want you now, and, and we often model what people show us, I want you to think about what you can do to help somebody who's scared. If someone comes to you and they say, I'm scared, think about it. Like, pa like pause the podcast for a moment and just think about it. What do you do to help them if they're scared? If you just pause, welcome back. If someone that I care about deeply says, I'm scared, I would try to create a feeling of safety and connection. Okay, I'm scared often means I don't feel safe. How can you make somebody feel safe? You can show them that they're not alone. What does that look like? Guys, no one is going to get angry at you. Like, okay, I can't say no. Like, virtually no one is going to get angry at you if you tell them, I'm here for you. I'm with you. You're not alone. I care. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. That's what we want to say. If somebody comes to us and they're angry, I want you to think I'm scared, okay? And I want you to come, come from a place of empathy to try make them feel better. Now, another thing that we do when people are angry is we, we try to calm them down, okay? Now, how do we calm people down? Do you know the best ways, the most effective ways to calm somebody down? I bet you do. What's your instinct? If a baby's crying, what's your instinct? What do you see? Because our instincts are very often actually right. We just have to apply them properly. If a baby's crying, okay, and we want to calm them down, what, we're, what we very often do is you pick them up, you rock them, and what do they say? What does like a mom say? She says, mommy's here, mommy's here. What are you saying? I'm here, I'm here. You pick them up, you're the baby, you hold them, you rock them, and you say, you're not alone. Look, it's okay. I'm here. You can feel me. You can see me. I'm here. It's okay. It's okay. And mommy, what does she do? She smiles. She smiles. It's okay. She's modeling to the baby what she wants the baby to do using mirror neurons. Okay? 
so that the baby will calm down and, and mirror what the mom is doing. Now, you can do the same thing with your partner, okay? You don't have to pick them up, but just ask, can I hold you? Can I hug you? Often when we are held, we feel so much better. Our skin is the biggest organ in our body, and it's full of nerves. And when we activate those nerves from a place of care, like by hugging our partner, it very often creates a sense of warmth and connection and comfort that leads to the sense of safety. Isn't that beautiful? Now, what about rock? So you don't have to rock your partner, like they're, you know, they're not a baby, like they're big, like it might, you might not physically be able to, but, it, but you can do something else. You can put your hand on their cheek and you can gently like pat their cheek or you can put your hands, like your arm around them and gently make lines up and down on their back or on their arm. This kind of thing, it's, it's going to help calm them down, but ask them first, is it okay with you if I hold you? Can we cuddle? Something like this. So now we're going to apply those first two strategies together, okay? The first that we talked and the second. So the first is somebody comes to you and they're angry, angry, angry. Urgh. What do we do? We're going to first try to create connection, okay? There's a number of ways that we can create connection. But a like, really important one, like we discussed, is to share how we feel with them. But more so, especially if they're angry, we want to invite them to share how they feel with us. When people share feelings, it creates connection. So someone's coming, oh, like, I'm so angry. Okay, you can see they're angry. What do you do? The first thing is just describe what you see. Okay, tell them. Wow, like, it seems to me that you're really upset right now. And they're like, yeah, I am. I am really upset. And then you can be like, oh my goodness, like, tell me more. Okay, what, what can I do? Can, can I hug you? And then they're going to be like, yeah, uh, sure. Okay. And then you hug them. And then you can say something like, what's wrong, baby? Like, what's wrong? Or just tell me how you feel. What do you feel? And then they, they tell you how they feel, okay? And then you can get even deeper. You can say, so, but, okay, so here you want to create connection. So you're going to now repeat back what they told you to, to see if you got it right. You're creating connection. That's your goal. Create connection. Honey, how do you feel? What do you feel? I feel like you don't care about me. I feel so lonely. I feel like you don't even love me anymore. Sometimes I wonder if you hate me. And then you're going to say something like, wow, it seems to me that you feel lonely, like I don't even care about you, and, and that sometimes you think that I hate you. Do I have it right? And, she, and then your partner's like, yeah. And then you're like, oh my goodness, that must be so hard. I'm so sorry. Like, wow, what is, is it, what can I do right now to help you? I want to help you calm down and feel better. And they can say, Ugh, like, I'm just so angry. I just need space for myself right now. That's okay. Give them space. They know what they need. Okay? They need space. Give them space. If they say something else, like, I just need you to hold me right now. I feel so lonely. Hold them. Okay? And just, you want to create connection. You can ask them, like, what do you feel? Where do you feel it? What does it feel like in your body? Do you feel it in your chest? Do you feel it in your head? Is it in your breathing? Ask them by asking them this. What we're doing is, is we're, again, creating connection, that dialogue. And then you can create connection by describing what you feel. You can say, I feel so ashamed to see you like this. You're my treasure, and I haven't been treating you the right way. If this is how you feel, it breaks my heart to see you like this because I care so much about you, and you're so important to me. That creates connection, guys. We're sharing feelings. We're adding to the emotional bank account. We're also creating a sense of safety by holding our partners and by allowing our partners to communicate and assuring them, I'm with you. It's going to be okay. Honey, I'm just so hurt. I'm angry. I don't know what to do. I don't know if I'm doing it right. Honey, I'm with you. It's going to be okay. I'm with you. I'm here. I care. And we're going to figure this out together. Guys, creating connection. Wow. 
and creating a sense of safety. Also modeling what we want to see in our partner. Our partner brings us anger. I know it's hard, but just remember, you have to model it. We're going to show them care, okay? Compassion. Show a look of concern and care on your face. Try, really feel it. And your partner will feel it too, okay? So we talked about those three things that lead to anger, okay? Oh. The first two that we already mentioned are a lack of connection, needing anger to create connection, which you can prevent through just leaning into your relationship, trying to share emotions as much as you can, calling throughout the day, for example, or just really connecting, by sh you know, really sharing, like being present. It may be hard for you because you don't like your emotions, like you hate, you don't, you're not connected to your body, you don't like your body, you're ignoring your emotions, you're ignoring your feelings, and you're thinking that it's going to work for you, but guys, it's not going to work for you, okay? If you're distancing yourself from your emotion, and you're numbing yourself by watching TV, you're trying to ignore how you feel, you're not going to be able to bring those feelings to your partner, and it's going to lead them to feel suffocated, like they don't have any connection, it's going to, it's going to hurt them, we need to bring our emotions to the table. It's hard. If you're scared of your emotions and you're avoiding them, it's hard. But you have to. It's part of what makes us human. We connect on an emotional level and we have to share our emotions with each other. Okay? Our partners. Next up, sense of safety. Not feeling safe, whether it's something from within the relationship or outside of the relationship. We need to build the sense of safety by thinking, what do we do if someone doesn't feel safe? They're angry. We need to think, I need to make them feel safe. And we do that through holding them, through communicating, allowing them to express how they feel and assuring them that I'm with you. It's going to be okay. You know how to do this already. This is the default, default response that you do with like a baby. Okay. Pick them up, hold them. And you say, it's going to be okay. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, same thing. It works to adults too. Just instead of picking them up, ask if you can hug them. Instead of rocking them, ask if you can like stroke their cheek or something. Okay, and still say, guys, it's so important. It works on any age, guys. We're humans. It works for all humans. I'm with you. I'm with you. I care. It's going to be okay. And model, just like the mom smiles to the baby when the baby's crying or shows care and concern, you can do the same thing with your partner. The third reason that anger arises in a relationship, and the, another huge one, maybe the biggest thing that we can do to prevent it, is because our limits aren't being met, or our love tanks, how loved we feel from our partner, isn't being filled. So, this is usually the result of something building up over two weeks, okay? Like, two weeks, like... You don't get to work out one day because you're, you're spending so much time with your partner, then you can't work out again later in the week, then you can't work out again later in the week, and you're just so frustrated that you can't work out that you just yell at your partner like two, like, you know, two weeks after the first incident. I need to work out. I feel like you're taking over my life. I feel like you're ruining my life. I just need space. I don't have any space. <laughs> it's building up over two weeks, this. Limits, limits. Guys, we talked about limits. They are so important. I would recommend you re-watch, sorry, re-listen to this podcast on limits, even if you listened to it recently, just to help you get the knowledge, okay? And, and eventually we'll have worksheets we'll share on our website, learnlove.ca, that can help you also grasp the content. Limits are things that we can't give up, okay? Things that are so important to us that we can't give up and we need them to have the space to thrive. I want you to think of this analogy, okay? There are two trees, Trees have a lot of roots, like really big roots, okay? I didn't fully understand the extent of how much roots a tree has till the first time I saw pictures of it. It's really, really cool. Um, but trees have like almost as much roots as they have branches. Like, isn't that amazing? So what happens if you put two trees close to each other? Can you guess? If two trees get too close... Their roots topple each other. They get too close. They take up all the nutrients. And there's not enough nutrients in the soil for both trees to survive. They die. If two trees get too close to each other, they die. It's the same thing with us and our partner. 
We need space. Trees need space in the ground to get nutrients that they need to grow and thrive. And we need space too from our partners to be able to thrive as individuals. We need to protect things that are important to us. The ability to go out with friends, the ability to speak on the phone with our family, the ability to go out, you know, go out sometimes, exercise, do yoga, do whatever we want, you know, to meditate. We need space. We need space to watch our shows. You know, like people just have things that they need that they're not willing to give up. For example, like hobbies too. Like we, if you're going to a dance class for like a decade, you know, and suddenly your partner wants to go out with you and spend all their time with you and they tell you, I'm so lonely, don't go to dance class. It's like, well, I've been doing this all my life and I needed to thrive. Like, it's so important to who I am. I can't give this up. These are places we need to put limits. We need to have a discussion with our partner and tell them, and, and this is on our blog, Limits Make Me Who I Am, and Tools to Set Limits. Um, check it out, learnleft.ca slash blog. We need to protect those areas of our life where we're going to feel suffocated. What makes a good limit? Clear, consistently enforced, and well advertised, okay? We need to have a limits conversation with our partner, and we need to tell them, this is really important to me. I can't give this up and be so specific. I need to go out with my friends two times a week, like in the evening, maybe from like 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock, um, just to have some breathing space and... Okay, so clear. It's very clear. Friends twice a week. Evening. Okay? Next, consistently enforced. Every time that this comes up, you're going to go out with your friends, unless it's an emergency. Like if your partner says, I'm so lonely, you have to stay, and it's so important to you, you can't give it up, you need to go. Okay? Unless it's an like, emergency, like someone's dying or something, or like funeral. I don't know. Okay. Then your partner will eventually get the message that it's just what you need. Okay, if you give it up, you're going to feel suffocated and the relationship is going to eventually sizzle out. It's just what you need. Next, well advertised. How is a limit well advertised? It is very present. Like, for example, speed limit signs. A speed limit sign on a road isn't there just once. It's many, many times. Like every kilometer and a highway there's like another speed limit sign it's like i know the speed limit thank you very much but they're just going to show you more and more and more and more and more to remind you well advertise make a limits board where like you put up your limits like like it's a board and each of you have half a chart and you just write what your limits are so the other person can see what you need or make a book like like get a get a workbook from the dollar store or something where you just write down your limits. Each of you have some pages to write what you need and agree to it. You may have to compromise. Like if your partner really wants to do something on a Friday, but Friday is like a dinner time for you, then you need to find a way to compromise. Um, but once you agree, like write it down and then it's well advertised. Whenever you don't know what your partner's limits are, you can just go and look. Now, if you don't abide to your partner's limits, and if you don't set up limits, and if you don't think what your limits are, okay, a lot of us walk around having no idea what our limits are, and then we are ex expect our partners to treat us in a certain way, you're asking for failure. Your limits are not going to be kept because you're not enforcing them, okay? Like, you don't know what they are. You don't tell your partner. Your partner doesn't just know. You have to, like, tell them. Um, they're not being kept. It's not obvious, guys. You need to make it clear. Okay, and then you're going to feel like over two weeks, it's going to grow, 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 and then it's going to explode. It's the same thing with love tanks. Remember, we talked about love tank, the way we share and receive love. If you're not loving your partner in a way that they understand love, okay, like their love language is words of affirmation. By this, I mean like they perceive love through compliments or like validations, telling them that they're doing, that they're doing something right and you're not doing that, they're going to feel like you don't love them. They're not going to feel loved, and it's going to build up, build up, build up for a few weeks, and then they're not going to be able to take it anymore, and it's going to show up in anger, okay? Anger. We need to have consistent check-ins, guys. Why do There's a word for this. Venting. Venting. Guys, what is venting? So this is great. Like, think of anger building up, 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 like a tank. It's building, like, up, 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 and then... Boom, it explodes after two weeks. Okay, that's why we make venting. Every day with your partner, I want you to ask them these questions. Okay, how's your love tank? 
how love, just ask them like that, or you can say instead if you prefer, how loved do you feel? Like how, from a scale of one to 10, like how satisfied are you with the way, like with, with the relationship today? Or like, how loved do you feel for me? Ask them a question like this and let them say something like one in 10. Okay. So like 10 being like, I feel really loved from you. And one, like, I don't feel so loved. I feel like really unloved from you. And five is like, ugh, like not the best, not the worst. Okay. So let's say they tell you like 10, I feel so loved. I'm so happy. Okay. That's great. That's a great indication. You can also think like, what am I doing that got the 10? What was around the 10? Okay. It's going to help you learn. And if they tell you something like six, then you can say, huh, what can I do to help you get to 10? Guys, it's a beautiful question. You know why? Because your partner, this is what's going to happen. It's going to go from 10, 9, 8, 7, 6 over like two weeks, maybe even months. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. When it gets to like one, boom, you're going to have a fight. I guarantee it. Actually, I can't guarantee it, but I think it's very likely that you're going to get to a fight then. But if you ask your partner, you make opportunities for venting, for this open discussion where you're like, okay with getting some feedback, okay? Like, you know, we need feedback to learn. Then you're going to catch it early. You're going to catch it at a six and get it to a 10. We can't always be at 10, you know, get it to like a seven or an eight before it gets down to three. That's not, you know, that's a no-go. These are like early warning signs. The same thing is with our limits. If our limits aren't being kept, if we don't have the space that we need to thrive from our partner, what's going to happen? We're going to feel like, ugh, it's going to build up. It's going to build up. Two weeks, boom, boom, boom. Later, poof, we're going to explode. I don't have time to work out anymore. I feel like you're taking all my time. I feel like you're ruining my life. I just don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> boom. How can we catch this early? Every day, ask your partner. Honey, how do you feel I'm treating you with regards to your limits? Do you feel like you have the space you need to thrive? Do you feel like I'm being in line with your limits? Huh. Wow, somebody cares about me enough to ask. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, guys, this is a great question. Then your partner's going to be like, yeah, honey, I, have, I can work out. I love that I can talk to you. I'm like, everything's good. Thank you so much for asking. How am I treating you with regards to your limits? Guys, it's a beautiful question. Honey, honestly, honestly, like <laughs> if you want me to be completely honest with you, I feel like I haven't had enough time for myself. I feel like you always want to cuddle. You always want to watch a movie with me. I just, I need time to breathe sometimes. It's like, it's not, it's not that I like you, like, I don't want you to feel like I don't like you, but I just need some time to be alone. Like, is that okay? Yeah. Guys, feedback. We're not perfect. You don't have to be perfect. If you come into the relationship thinking that you don't have to be perfect, then it's okay. If you make mistakes and you're in it to learn and grow, then perfect. That, you know, that's great. That's great. You're going to respond to your partner like, yeah, honey. Oh my God, of course. Thank you so much for bringing that up to my attention. What are some things that I can do to help you feel like you have more space? And then your partner, it's up to your partner now, and you can help your partner think about what is it exactly that they mean. Remember, limits have to be clear, consistently enforced, and well advertised. If any one of those three aren't there, it's not going to get enforced. More of this in our limits exercise. Uh, sorry, the limits podcast episode, or in our two blog posts on limits on the website. And then your partner's going to say, well, I haven't been spending enough time with my friends. I want to call them. Can we make like twice a week when I can just speak to my friends for like an hour, an hour and a half? And like, you just don't come in the room. I just have some space. Or like, I need to go out. Can I just like go for a walk sometimes by myself? I just need like some time to breathe. Yeah, sure. Don't get offended, guys. You don't have to be perfect. You're learning. That's okay. It's like grade school. You know, you don't get offended if you don't get a calculus question right in grade eight. You learn. You make mistakes eventually. You know, by grade 12, you learn. Learning is making mistakes. Learning is the ability to look at something in the past and recognize that it was a mistake or that you didn't get it right. You have to not get it right to learn it. And we're always learning. It's okay to learn. It's okay to get things wrong as long as you are open to feedback and to learn to get better. Now, by asking these questions, guys, every day, we're catching things early before they explode. I believe this method combined with creating a sense of safety with our partners, okay, making them feel safe and understood, and also 
creating connection, building that emotional bank account is going to prevent the vast, vast, vast majority of fights. If fights do arise, recognize I'm angry equals I'm scared, okay? And then try to create a sense of safety in the relationship. Remember those three things that make people calm down. Holding, okay? Or like like hugging, rocking, or like for you it could be like patting their cheek. And making that connection. I'm with you. It's going to be okay. Like I'm with you. I care. I'm here. Like you would do to a baby. Okay? Now... There are some other things that we can use here too. Uh, we talked about connections. So remember on the connection thing, we don't want to label our partners, okay? We're, we're seeing the world a little bit subjectively, kind of through stories that we tell ourselves. The more of this in the next episode. What we want to do instead is just create that connection by repeating back what we see and asking our partner if we got it right. When people feel understood, it's creating intimacy, it's creating that emotional bank account, safety, connection, that's going to help our partners calm down. And we also talked about modeling. So try to model what you want to see in your partner. If your partner's angry at you, I know this is hard, but just model care, model compassion, like a mother would to a baby, okay? Mom smiles when the baby cries. Try, I mean, you don't have to be so exaggerated, so extreme, but just try to show compassion and care, and eventually your partner will model that too. Now, finally, I want to just share that you don't have to wait for conflict to arise in order to practice these skills. So a lot of us, like there's a saying that a lot of people only recognize that they need to start eating healthier after their first heart attack. We don't have to wait for crisis before we go into, like, like, you know, to try to get better. Like, you don't have to wait for the heart attack until you decide to start improving your diet. It's the same thing with conflict resolution, guys. It's, it's a tool. Like, it's, it's a muscle. We can strengthen it. We can make it stronger. So when, when it's not bad, okay, like when times are good and you're not in conflict, you can ask your partner, honey... Let's say you were really sad. Like, what can I do to help you calm down? What, like, what do you like that helps you calm down when you're sad? It's a beautiful question. Your partner's going to be like, wow, somebody cares about me enough to ask. The other thing you can do is you can just think that you're perfect. I'm perfect. I don't need to ask. I'm not going to ask you. I know what to do. Guys, you don't know what to do. If there's one thing you take away from the show is that you don't know until you ask. Okay. We all think that we're the experts on everything. You know, we know what to do. We don't have to ask. It's going to come naturally, guys. And often you need to ask, okay? You need to create a blueprint, like a manual to help your partner love you and then to help you learn to understand your partner. We say so often, love is knowing. The more you know your partner, the more you can love them. The more you know yourself, the more you can love yourself. By discovering your limits, by learning about your partner and, the, and both of your styles, like what works for you when times are good, you're knowing each other more and you'll eventually love each other and yourself more through this discovery process. That is my hope for you. Thank you so, so much for listening to this episode where we talked about conflict resolution. We spoke about the three main ways to prevent most conflicts and what to do when conflicts actually arise. So the, those three main things that we talked about again is creating connection. So there's no void that causes anger. Okay. These are like those, these three things are also like the main reasons that anger occurs. You're building that emotional bank account. That's the first one. Create connection, build the emotional bank account. The next thing is that we don't feel safe. So we can create a sense of safety by holding our partner, like patting their cheek, ask them first if it's okay with them and telling them I'm with you. I'm here. Okay. And then giving them an opportunity to communicate, to express themselves, to, to say what they feel, to create that connection and model what we want to see. So if we want to create a safe space, we show compassion. If you just show anger, it's not going to create safety. It's going to exaggerate that event. Remember, I'm angry equals I'm scared. I'm hurt. I'm lonely. I'm lost. Think that they're telling you this when they come to you with anger, 
want to calm them down, and then we will be able to help them. When things are calm, then we can talk about it more and, and say a little bit more about where we're coming from. But first, we just want to calm the situation down. We're going to explore this a lot, lot more in the next episode, okay? In the next one, we're going to talk about the consciousness car with the driver and the passenger. You're going to guess which one is the thinking and feeling brain, how to connect with emotion. And we're going to look at anger through this from a totally, totally new perspective and discuss some other tools we can do to deal with anger. Now, just to keep on wrapping up this episode, we also talked in that last part that anger can be prevented through venting. Often it is something that's held in for two weeks that explodes by creating those opportunities to vent. We can calm down anger by asking every day, how do you feel? How's your love tank? Okay, it's not just connect, creating connection, it's giving the opportunity to vent before problems get bigger. Another thing, if the person, if your partner is angry, you can create these opportunities to vent in, their, in the anger episode. So if they're angry because they feel like their limits aren't being met, give them the chance to say that. Let them speak. We have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen twice as much as we speak. We'll talk about this more in the next episode. Another thing we mentioned at the beginning that I want to come back to is we said it's so important, I have to take care of myself to take care of you. We're going to get to this more in future episodes, but it's so important because mastering your mirror neurons, learning, learning to like show compassion and model that when your partner is angry, being able to come to a place from curiosity and understanding, learning to be in, in control of your emotions, learning, you know, practicing to do the right thing. Um, like remembering what your partner said when they when you asked them before, hopefully, what can I do to help you when you're upset? Okay, like it takes a lot of self-care. We need to take care of ourselves so that we can be at a better potential. Like if you don't exercise enough and you don't take care of your own needs, you're going to feel stressed. It's going to be much harder for you to feel in control when conflict arises. When we take care of ourselves, we put ourselves in a better position where we can control our emotions more, we can think better, we can breathe clearer, more on breathing also in the next episode, and we can just do the right thing. By, by taking care of ourselves, we make it easier for us to do the right thing in times of anger. And it's also going to help us make, feel less stressed. When we're stressed, it's harder to focus and it takes a lot of focus and discipline and practice and, and attention to be able to model compassion when someone comes to you in anger, okay? To be able to put them first and to listen instead of want to speak, okay? Our default is like to get angry too. It takes a lot of work to override this basic emotion and actually be more effective by showing compassion, but through taking care of ourselves, we can make it a little bit easier. So think about your limits, think about what you need from your partner, and try to advocate for it a little bit more in a respectful way, like by having that limits conversation. And just remember, the more you take care of yourself, the more effective you can be at being a good partner, at helping your partner, and at helping yourself succeed in all other aspects of your life. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you found it meaningful and that you'll be able to apply it to your relationship and other areas of your life too, like with your family or your friends. I hope you learned a lot about anger. I hope that you thought about some tools that you can use when anger arises and that you remember I'm angry usually equals I'm scared. It will totally, totally change the way you perceive anger now and in the future. In the next episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about anger. We're going to talk about the consciousness car with the thinking and feeling brain that was first introduced to me by Mark Manson and Everything is Pucked. It's a super, super interesting concept. I'm so excited to get to it with you. This analogy is also going to help you think about anger in a totally different and super, super helpful, helpful way. We're also going to expand more on tools we can use to deal with anger, such as how to stand up for ourselves without causing more problems, how to do it effectively, 
and so much more tools that can help us. This is all really essential to build a healthy and strong, long-lasting relationship. You don't have to go in blind and make mistakes, guys. Like They're effective ways of doing things. I so hope that through this podcast, we can share some of those tools with you to help you stay together. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for listening. It's been an absolute pleasure creating this episode and having you on board. I'm so happy that you listened to the end. If you want more from us, check out our other podcast episodes on the Learn to Love podcast. It's full of great content that we're adding every week. Things that is all about helping you stay together. Check out our website if you prefer blogs. Our blogs are a little bit different to our podcasts. Sometimes they're more in depth. Sometimes we take a different style. Sometimes we use like infographics. A lot of them have infographics and charts. So if you're more of a visual learner, definitely check out our website, learnlove.ca. We have a ton of future things in progress, like our Udemy course, which we're working on. It's going to have, I think, eight units with like five, six lessons per unit, all about staying together. Um, We're working on our social media channels. So uh, we're creating a Facebook page. Uh, We're working on a Pinterest uh, and a Twitter, which is so exciting to engage with you and to reach more people. If you find this content helpful and you think it will help somebody else, pass it along or give us a nice rating. Ratings will help this podcast get seen more and please share it on social media. If you have any questions or feedback from the show, I'd love to hear from you. You can send us an email at contact at learnlove.ca. That's contact at learnlove.ca. I read every email that gets sent to us, and I always, always love to see your feedback. We can only get better with your feedback, okay? I want to hear from you what you think of the show, what you thought of this episode, and what you want to see in future episodes. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, for listening and for taking part in this journey to be more effective lovers, to stay together and make our relationships healthier, stronger, and more enjoyable. I'm so happy to welcome you back to the next episode. And I'll see you there when we talk more about conflict, anger, and strategies we can use to make dealing with conflict a little bit easier. Thank you so much for joining me and I'm so excited to welcome you back in the next episode.